All right, hour number two on a Friday. Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you, One Bills Live. And joining us now to break down the latest position group for us, senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joining us. Greg, good to have you with us. And uh, I know we've been pounding the heck out of the receiver position. We've even done that with you more than once. But uh, we're going to flip sides of the ball here and go D-line. Um, and I guess we'll we'll start with the defensive tackle class, which by most accounts uh, has some measure of drop-off uh, pretty quickly uh, after that quote-unquote top tier. But... Um, we know, we know Byron Murphy is going to be gone in the first 20 picks, so we're not even going to bother with him. And uh, he's, he, he's the best one based on tape, without question. Yeah. But we'll move on from him and go to Johnny Newton, who I think is, in, is an interesting case because uh, a lot of people say, you know, not ideal in terms of size, but you want to talk about production, he's got that. I'm just glad he changed his name, you know, uh, and now we're calling him Johnny because I had no idea how to pronounce his name before. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, on. Yeah. I mean, he he's of the kind of and then you guys will remember this. He's kind of of the Geno Atkins school in terms of body type. Mm, yeah. um, you know, Grady Jarrett, who now plays in the league, would be like that to some degree at Oliver, who obviously, you know, well, you know, he's one of those sort of compact, muscular build guys but he's got exceptional quickness and burst um, at times, really active and sudden and violent hand usage. Um, I would say he's more of a pass rusher than a run defender at this point. Um, he's got light, quick feet. He plays on his toes, which is really interesting for a guy that size with that body type. Um, I think his game's built more on quickness than power. Um, he's a one gra- one gap penetrating D tackle, you know, essentially a three technique in a four man base front. Um, could he play in a in a five man front? Uh, sure. I mean, everybody sort of does that now. The, the the Bills really don't, but a lot of teams do. Um, but I see him more as a um, as a three technique in a four man D line even front. You know, the Bills their base front is a uh, is an over front, so you'd have a three technique. Um, he played three technique in that. Right, but, and as you get closer, he had a really nice season for Illinois, Defensive Player of the Year in the Big Ten. Um, how much help did he get from the guys around him? Be, playing at Illinois, I would think that, and playing at that high a level, did he stand out because he was kind of by himself on that defense? What? How no. does when you watch tape, you know, does he dominate lesser opponents? Does he play well against big time guys? Um, he, they actually had a pretty good defense. They have, they have a, a stand up backer. Um, named Seth Coleman, who uh, I thought was going to come out, who chose to go back, who, depending on the year he has in 2024, could be a, a top 60 pick for sure. And then there was another player, uh, Keith Randolph, on that D-line, who I don't think he had this, the year he was expecting, but he'll get drafted. Um, no, uh, you know, it's funny you ask that. I, you know, all the, none of these guys come out without any concern, Steve, as you know. Um, and, you know, when you watch Newton, there are times he came off the ball too high. He lost some quickness and explosiveness. The question is, can that be fixed? Um, you know, uh, he, you know, he's a power player um, and that's what he is. You know, I think he has to become a better run defender in the National Football League if he's to play uh, every snap, you know, a full time player. Um, so, you know, every once in a while. And, and this happens a lot, by the way, with guys who play a lot of snaps in college but aren't going to play that many snaps in the NFL. Um, sometimes the you see plays where the effort isn't quite what it is. You know, there's a lack of intensity. That's just because they play so many snaps in college football. But in terms of the traits that he has, they're pretty high level. You know, he, he's, he can be a dominant inside pass rusher, and that's really – that's what he is. He's a one-gap pass rusher. All right, so let's move on to another guy in the Big Ten, Chris Jenkins, who obviously has NFL bloodlines. He's not nearly as big as his dad was. Uh, he's probably about 65 pounds lighter, um, but more, more of a looser athlete than his dad. What is, what is, is the ceiling maybe the most attractive quality here? Because, I don't know, I think some of these Michigan guys get dinged because they don't necessarily have the production but there are some that argue there's like this team first mentality that was at Michigan under Harbaugh that kind of doesn't allow uh, players to truly 
maybe shine individually. Do you subscribe to any of that? No. Um, <laughs> because I don't think that I don't think that has anything to do with what their traits and attributes are. Now yeah. you're talking about production, which is that's it's like players on George's defense. Not all their guys have big production because they have so many five stars. Michigan's probably in a similar category, but that has nothing to do with their traits and their attributes. Um, I don't care whether Jenkins had six sacks or three sacks. The traits are the same. Um, he's a guy that initially is going to be a, a run defender. Um, he's the, the bottom line as he enters the NFL Brownie is that he doesn't really have any meaningful pass rush profile at this point in time. He doesn't really have any one gap penetrating traits at this point in time. So those are projections. Um, you may think he can do it. And in three years, you may say, wow, we drafted the right guy, and this is this is special. Um, but that's not what he showed now. Um, you know, now he's much more of a a guy who'll be in his NFL career as a rotational second unit base defense D tackle. Um, I don't think he's a one gap player at this point in time. You hope he becomes more than that. You know, when I was watching him, I was thinking of players like Ashawn Robinson, guys like that who are you know base defense D tackles, really important players on defenses. Um, but you're, what you're seeing on tape with him is, is just what I said. So you have to, you're projecting, you're hoping he can become more than that. There are snapshots. There are flashes, um, of pass rush throughout. He showed an effective spin move here and there. So the question is, can that be a starting point to develop into at least a functional inside pass rusher at the next level? Cause he's not really that right now. Yeah. So where does it, and if, and let's face it. Most teams value the pass rush as much or more these days than they do even ability to run stuff, even in a defensive tackle, even, you know, because right. they almost take for granted the ability to stop the run in the NFL because they do it with scheme and guys in gaps and that gap integrity. And if you're big yeah. enough to hold it, you know what I'm saying? So the no pass rush, so that's going to drop Chris, guys like Chris Jenkins, who are old fashioned run stuffers. That, that hurts them, right? Yeah, that's what his tape showed. Now, like I said, right. then it becomes a projection, um, and and th that's why the draft is hard, and that's why sometimes you get guys right and sometimes you get them wrong um, because you can look at a guy like Chris Jenkins and say, man, those snapshots of pass rush are really good. I think he can become a great pass rusher. And if he doesn't, you know, and if you draft him with the idea that he's going to be that, which means you would draft him higher because obviously run defenders if you are not drafted as high. No one, or you shouldn't anyway, you know, in, in my view, but that's just my right. opinion. Normally just run defenders are not top 15 or top 20 picks in a draft, and no one's suggesting that Chris Jenkins would be. But um, you're you're trying to figure out, as you project him, is, is there more to his game that can be cultivated and developed beyond being a rotational piece in a seven- or eight-man D-line rotation? That's what, right. you, that's what you have to decide. Right, yeah. Right. All right. Next up is uh, the behemoth from Texas, Tavondre ah. Sweat. Um, probably one of the few true nose tackle types. Has some pretty nimble feet for being 362 pounds. Would you consider him more than just a phone booth player, Greg? Yes. And I think the tape tells you that. I was fascinated by this kid. Yeah. Um, there's probably no question he should probably have a few more salads, brownie, than maybe bagels and <laughs> cream cheese. But. Um, <laughs> But I, I think he's a fascinating project. Now, of course, he just, I think, had the DUI. But let's put that aside for the moment. Um, he's he's a massive man. He clearly has space eater qualities, no question. He's a challenge to block one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I'll tell you what. He showed quickness off the ball. He won in gaps. He won with hand usage. He won with range. He showed some pass rush. Um I think he has untapped potential as a pass rusher. Now, he weighed 366 at the Combine. My guess is he's not going to weigh 366 when he plays in the NFL. Um, you know, keep one thing in mind. He came to Texas, okay, as a high school DN at 6'3", 249. So this guy is not like a history when he was 12 years old of being a big fat guy. Um so he can probably lose some weight. Now you don't want to, you know, you're not looking to get him to 300, but if he could lose 20 pounds, that would be a big deal. I'll give you an example. He's way better in terms of his movement than someone like Jordan Davis. He's not going to be drafted as high as Jordan Davis, but he's a far better prospect. 
I got to tell you, the more I watched him, and I watched a ton of Texas because they had, you know, Murphy, they had him, they had the linebacker, Jalen Ford. Um, I almost thought that he was potentially, if, again, I'm just telling you now, if it all comes together, I don't want people to think I'm saying this is what he is tomorrow. If we're to all come together, I kind of saw him like a Vita Vea or a Dexter Lawrence or Fletcher Cox type player. I mean, there's a lot there. He has really light feet for a big man. Yeah, and he he seems strikes me as a guy, a space eater. I always think back to my old teammate Ted Washington. We've had you know oh, every yeah, time he's, he's he's more nimble than that, uh, Steve. Right, exactly. Yeah, that the guy that you know he's going to be in the middle of a really good run defense, no matter what anything happens around him, because you can't move him. Um, right. But you're but you're selling. He's a much better athlete than people are giving him credit for because of of his weight. Yeah, I mean you see him. I mean even at the combine, he moved pretty well. I mean he's. He's not just in his movement a big fat guy, um, but you know we'll see. I, you know, uh, you, the DUI is going to hurt him as far as the draft. I imagine. You know, sure. we'll see. You know, I don't know if he has any history of of anything else. I don't get to see that stuff. Teams have all that info. I don't. Um, but he was he was kind of a fun watch, and I watched a lot of games. Right. Yeah, one guy that that I liked at least on tape. I was a little disappointed to see how undersized he was. Was Makai Wingo from LSU? Um, Missouri transfer, uh, guy transfers to LSU. They name him captain. Um, I, I was impressed yeah. by that, uh, unrelenting work ethic, according to his coaches. And I think he's got some burst, but how much is the size going to hurt him, Greg, at just over six foot and 284? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's along the lines of the kid who came out from Pitt last year, Kalijah Cansey, remember him mm -hmm. uh, who went to Tampa? Um, he's not quite as explosive as Cansey. Cansey almost was like a running back. Um, it could hurt him, but there's no question that he he doesn't have the size uh, and length ideally desired, you know, for the position of D tackle. But there's no question as well that he's really compact and explosive. I mean, he's another fun guy to watch on tape. He can win the leverage game. He can generate strength and power with his first step explosiveness. Um, you know, he's going to be one of those guys, Brownie, that there'll be some teams, you know, that with their critical factors template, all teams have that, as you know, that may say, ah, he's not even on our draft board because we're not drafting a six foot, 284 pound defensive tackle. There might be other teams that say, hey, this guy's tape is really good. And it's been good for two years there. So um, I, I like watching his tape. I don't know how teams will see him, but there's definitely something there. Um, in fact, I like watching him much more than his teammate, who was a big, big time recruit, Mason Smith, yeah. whose tape did not really jump out to me much at all. Right. I mean, he was coming, mm -hmm. Mason Smith's coming off the ACL injury, you know, and was re coming back from that this year. But I, I agree with you. I like Wingo more than Smith. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I did too. I mean, Smith, Smith, you know, he's the kid who got hurt celebrating in the first game two years ago. Right. People might remember that. Um, he was a consensus five-star coming out. He was the nation's top-rated D lineman. Um, I know he's coming back from the injury. He looked a little overweight this year. Maybe that's an issue. Um, but, I, but I think he's high-hipped and high-cut. He's a little stiff. He comes off the ball too high. Um, Steve, you know it's hard to fix the guys who come off the ball high. Um, right. That's a hard thing to fix. Yeah, it's it, – well – Seemingly so, because nobody seems to fix it. I mean, you get a guy yeah. that, you know, those guys with the long legs, you would think they would have to bend their knees more. They never do. They, they no, stay they long. never do. They, stay, yeah. they never do. Yeah. So, they, so it, yeah. it's, it's apparently impossible. Let's go one more prospect. Luke Ruke Orororo. Yeah. Good job, it's easy Steve. easy for you to say. Yeah. Well, we'll call him Ruke for now. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's... He is one of the most fascinating D tackles in this draft because he is so big at 6'4", 294, and doesn't look it. He's got tremendous arm length. He's a really good athlete. Um, and then you have to decide how that connects with the fact that he doesn't make a lot of plays. So, you know, some people will say, oh, if he doesn't make a lot of plays and he didn't make a lot of plays in college, he's not going to make a lot of plays in the NFL. Some people might say, oh, man. This guy is an athletic, strong guy, you know, really moves well. Um, you know, I, I mean, he doesn't have elite quickness, but at 294, how many guys would you say are elite or sudden? But he's really good athlete. Um, 
So much of the projection with him is what you believe he can become because you see a flash here and there, um, but he has a really strong traits profile and he's a big guy. Um, so you have to decide again, so much of the draft is, is about what projection about what you think a guy can become because, you know, even guys that put up big numbers at their position, it's not automatic that they're going to do that in the league. I mean, some people say that they say, well, they, you know, got a lot of tackles in college. They're going to get a lot of tackles in the NFL. You know, you don't know that it's a different game. Um, yeah. But this guy is a clear projection. But I mean, he is a big man who's clearly a plus athlete. And every once in a while he flashed and boy, did he look good. But he yeah. just doesn't do it very often. Right. The thing that was crazy to me is like people were knocking him because, oh, he doesn't have a pass rush repertoire and he doesn't have counter moves. And after I'm watching his tape, I'm like, he didn't need any because he won with power almost every single time. He just out muscled yeah. the offensive tackle and had 11 and a half sacks. Yeah. But in the NFL, he's going to need more tools in his tool. Yes. Um, yeah. There's no quite, cause I agree with you a hundred percent. I'll tell you, it's like you read my notes it, weakness. I said, needs many more tools in his toolbox as an inside rusher relied almost exclusively on his size and power. That's what he did. And yeah. in college at times it worked. Um, but at this point, you wouldn't call him, despite that sack number, Brownie, you would not call him a high-quality pass rusher. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, Braden Fisk, uh -huh. you know, six-year <laughs> senior. Uh, I know people are going to knock him for his lack of ideal size, too. 31-inch um, arms, people are going to knock that. That's going to be the issue, yeah. Um, maybe f first, after you kind of do the thumbnail sketch on him, Maybe explain to our listeners why short arms are not good when you're trying to win inside. Well, the reason short arms are viewed as a negative is because a major part of, of being able to play on the D line is to extend your arms and lock out. Because what that does is it keeps your feet and your lower body clean so that the offensive lineman can't get into your body and therefore prevent your lower body from moving. So being able to lock out with arm extension is a really important part of playing defensive line. And if you have shorter arms, it's more difficult to do that. But now let's get to Fisk, who is a joy to watch on tape. I mean, this guy... He, he camouflages his short arms. I mean, he showed two-gap ability, tremendous strength, he, and he uses his arms, even though they're shorter, really well. He, he has functional arm length. He locks people out really well, kept his lower body clean, um, and he did that as a pass rusher as well, and he's got tremendous quickness. Um, he's a really fun watch. He plays like a true athlete, um, and, but he's powerful, so he's not just a move guy. He's a powerful guy um, and a really good athlete. And to give you an example, uh, and just so people understand, his 20-yard shuttle time was like that of, of many wide receivers and, and, and defensive backs. He's a he's a fun watch. He's going to be an interesting guy. He could sneak into the late first round. Yeah, I I, right. I almost I saw a little of Kyle Williams in him when I was watching his tape. Ah, uh, yeah, um, that's 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 a pretty interesting comparison. Um, but, yeah, this guy – and, by the way, I, I didn't know much about him. I mean, you know, obviously I saw Florida State on TV once in a while, but I'm not sitting taking notes on guys when I watch college football. At the Combine, and we're seeing a clip here, um, he he blew it away. I mean, I didn't know much about him, but he looked so quick and so explosive doing all the drills. It was, it was really kind of an epiphany. I mean, I was like, oh, my God, who is this guy? Yeah, he, he did put up some unbelievable – he killed the combine. Like, his oh, workout, I mean, 4.78. I mean, that. Or I think it was even faster than that when they finally um, got through it, the official timing. was 4.78. The official oh, it was, was 4.78. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, some some crazy numbers, explosion numbers, all of that stuff. He killed everything. Um, and it was interesting because some people had kind of gotten the 4 one on him uh, and said he would do that going in. And sure enough, you know – I mean, just he, watch him do these drills. I mean – he just does not look like a 295 pound man. I mean, you right. know, that's, you kind of lose sight of that. We're so used to watching football and, and you know, we, we lose sight of how big these guys are. He does not move like a 295 pound man. No. Yeah, you're right. He moves with, you know, a suddenness of a, you know, of a five, nine guy. Right. I mean, he's, he really yeah, does I mean, seem to have a lot of, he's got that energy 
And certainly yeah. at the combine, they're on their best behavior, and they've they've got I mean, all. Look at this. I mean, this is a really good drill to show bend and movement. Yeah. You know, that's one of those good drills, and he just he made it look easy. He seems like and one of those guys that whatever he's got in the tank, he's going to exploit his full potential. You know, he seems like a guy that's going to reach whatever let roof he's got. Yeah, overachiever. Yeah, guy. he's an overachiever. I would agree. And he, he would know? also strike me, you always hear about coaches talk about, hey, the, the room, you know, hey, we, we, we have a great D-line room. We have a great quarterback room. I don't know, obviously, Braden Fisk at all, but he would strike me as a guy you want in your D-line room. Yeah. Right. Uh, Greg, we've run out of time. Before we even got to the edge guys, we'll have to do that next week. Uh, so put I'm, that on your to-do list. Those guys too, Brownie. I'm yeah. Gonna, so I've probably seen about 120 guys now in detail. So I'm just oh grinding away. All okay. Right. Uh, I'm glad you take notes. I don't know how you'd keep all of that in your brain. 120 people. So. Well, you know, I have to help. I have to help Tasker because I know he's a little behind. <laughs> <laughs> that much. I'm that far behind yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. I'm that far yeah, right. behind you. Uh, thanks, Greg. As always, we'll catch up with you next week. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh-huh.